top subscription economy metrics. So it proves to be pretty exciting. Um, what I want to do is let's go and get, get started. All right, so we have an agenda today. So obviously SendGrid and Emma are going to come up and talk about their subscription metrics that they use, how they use Zora, why that's important to them, and obviously broader topics about how that's important to their SaaS business. And love to be able to make this as interactive as possible. Feel free to jump in with questions, um, especially towards the end. Alrighty, so definitely don't want to stand in the way. Let me go ahead and get started. Let me go and introduce Jim Franklin, CEO of SendGrid. Are you like Thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm Jim Franklin, the CEO of SendGrid. Uh, I come from a traditional finance background, uh, accounting undergrad, uh, passed the CPA but never actually practiced. Uh, went on to law school, did a JB MBA, so I'm, I'm used to thinking about things from a sort of a traditional uh, point of view. Uh, and having been a CFO and then a VP of sales and now a CEO, I look at it, uh, financial metrics maybe a little differently uh, than some other people. Uh, as far as what is SendGrid, is, sometimes it's hard to do, describe, and I won't look at all those words on there, but rather it is, uh, those words, uh, think of your application and your, the inbox of your customer, and SendGrid is that connection point between the two. Uh, our three founders had started a number of web companies, and they found that all developers have this problem of getting mail from their application to the inbox. No developers like to mess with the mail. So SendGrid, we say, hey, focus on your own awesomeness, whatever it is your application does, and we'll take care of the mail. We want to move the world's wanted mail. And uh, to be that always-on global default choice, wherever people want to develop applications, we're just in the background, whether it's a hosting at Rackspace or if you're uh, developing on an engine yard, we're there to move the mail. And it's been quite as successful. It's been three years. Uh, we launched as part of Techstars in Boulder, summer of 09. Uh, we now have scaled to 60,000 customers, and we send over 5 billion emails a month. That's something like 3,000 emails per second, 24-7, so quite an operation. Uh, and we uh, built our own billing system to start, but we certainly didn't, didn't end there. Uh, some of our key goals, our number one key goal is to maximize developer mojo. Now that sounds like a weird goal but it's actually been the key to our success. If we focus on that as our number one rule, other good things happen. Our second key goal is growth. We're gonna talk about the financial metrics around growth, and then from that follows profitability. Now, how to uh, measure growth, you know, the key is MRR, you know, monthly recurring revenue. Uh, this can be, I guess, contrasted with CMRR. There's a lot of things to learn uh, in the subscription economy, which is committed or contracted monthly recurring revenue. Uh, at SendGrid, like many companies, we've had a lot of success. We make it very easy to onboard to our service. There is no contract, it's just month to month. So we don't really have that CMRR uh, concept. So we just think about it in terms of MRR. I think the other thing is to keep uh, an eye on is monthly measurement. Uh, compared to the broader economy where people have talked in terms of annual growth rates, I think in a subscription business, it's important to focus on monthly growth rates. So as a student of math, you have to start converting those monthly growth rates to annual growth rates and think about uh, how do those work. I think of you know, roughly 5% per month is doubling a year, and 10% a month is roughly, roughly tripling per year. And being somewhere in that uh, range or even better uh, is ideal. And then you know, counting customers. So we do a whole set of metrics around revenue and a whole set of metrics around customer count. Uh, and one of the uh, you know, first baselines is, are these paid customers or not paid customers? And you think that's a bright line and pretty easy to count. Uh, but really, there's a, uh, there's a middle group of customers, which can be material, which we call lightly paid customers. Uh, <coughs> specifically at SendGrid, we have a light product, right? And some of those invoices might be 10 cents or 48 cents or 72 cents. And I'm like, well, it, do they really count as a paid customer? Or they screw up all your metrics if you start including those. So it's important to... Uh, we segregate uh, materially paid, you know, paid, and then total customers, and have kind of three, uh, three cuts at the, uh, the numbers. So having a uh, framework to think about growth, there's really you know, two pieces of the equation, uh, sort of the increases and decreases, and then the net. Uh, and the increase is rather straightforward. 
uh, and thinking about just a, a model, right? Number of deals, size per deal, and then are they growing that and are we adding new things? SendGrid actually announced a newsletter product September 1st. So we asked the first time we're having a sort of a second service or a second revenue stream to attach. So that really changes our metrics and how we think about things. We want to track that uh, separately. And then on the uh, customer side uh, as well, the, the churn and the rate of reduction, which we'll talk about in a minute. So monthly recurring revenue. Now uh, this is the sort of core uh, metric. Uh, I think in any kind of uh, business intelligence system, you know, you have some kind of KPIs. Uh, I used to work at Oracle in the crystal ball business unit. We talked a lot about, you know, putting the K in KPI. And the hardest exercise is if you just had one metric, what would it be? And that's a very good exercise for a management team to think about. What is that one number when the board members say, how is business? Right? And you can just look to one number. Uh, and for us, it's sequentially, sequential monthly growth rate on an MRR basis. Uh, and so when I look at you know, this chart, you have to think about what's your, your beginning MRR, and then you know, new business that you've signed up, uh, and then you have the uh, increases from your existing customers, you know, less your uh, decreases from existing customers, and then less actually you know, companies that have completely churned out. I think the most important thing to do in this chart is divide the two numbers, the 1595 by the 1275, to look for that growth rate, which is about 25%. Again, and think about it monthly. Also, as a general manager, I look at each of those rows, and I want to have specific goals and tactics. Say between now and year end, I'll say to our you know, marketing person or, someone, or salesman, say, what should this number be at 1231? And what are we doing tactically to sort of move it? And then we track that uh, with our monthly board meetings against progress for all of those numbers. Uh, there's a couple of other interesting uh, effects here. Uh, one great thing about SendGrid is our 60,000 customers are all, you know, I call cool kid startups. And their business curves look something like this. But going straight up and to the right it masks a lot of uh, variation on the way up and to the right. So on an individual customer in any particular month, they might drop their volume with us by quite a lot, 30% or 80%. So they'll go up and then down, and then they'll go up and then down. And the ups net out the downs. But across 60,000 customers at any one month, a lot of them are going down. So when you look at the line, uh, decrease MRR, it's a lot of money. And so you really need to get underneath that and understand what's going on. If it's because you know, people are you know, uh, on their way out, they're turning off your system, they're, they're using push notifications instead of email, that's bad. Right? If it's just you know, no noise and what is otherwise a positive trend, eh, not so much to worry about. Uh, but that's why you have to kind of get underneath there, really understand uh, the data. Uh, the other interesting thing, I think, with a lot of companies uh, like Sanguid is there is the concept of a base charge for a month. It's kind of like a, a cell phone plan, right? You buy a, 100 minutes a month on your plan, and then if you go over, you pay at a heightened rate. And the base charges are paid uh, a month in advance. So on the first of the month, uh, we, we bill for those, those base charges. And at the end of the month, we then bill in arrears for the overages. And you know, keeping uh, uh, that clear is we'll do a set of metrics around recurring revenue for base revenue and looking at that growth rate month over month versus total revenue that includes overages. Because if we have a good month and say it's up 15% month on month, the first thing our board wants to know is like, well, was that just overages? Right? Or if you were to go to uh, the Square One or Silicon Valley Bank or something, right, they look at overages and say, oh, that doesn't count. Right? We just want to look at base revenue for any kind of uh, AR line or something like that. Well, you put on your cash flow hat, which is the most important hat to wear, and that's real money, right? I think uh, typically you might have you know, 20 or 25% of your business in sort of that overages bucket, and so you really need to keep your metrics separate, you know, whether it's base revenue or total revenue, including overage or usage-based charges. With that, let's look at uh, customer count. So this is uh, very insightful as well. Uh, having startups as our customer base you know, we have a high degree of customer churn by account basis, but on a revenue basis, uh, it's a much, much different story. Uh, but I think this is uh, relatively uh, straightforward. Again, looking towards uh, you know, different segments. So we we'll want to look at uh, customer count if they're in a, a free plan or a light plan or by marketing channel. Uh, we used uh, like ad affiliate networks to uh, uh, do some marketing. We've, and we looked at that, uh, that cohort and we found that they would churn out really fast. You know, they weren't high quality customers. We weren't, they weren't a good fit for our service. And so doing customer account analysis by marketing channel uh, is not easy. Uh, because we have maybe 
you know, 15 marketing channels running in any given month, but we'll look at a, you know, a global number and we'll know, well, geez, is that platinum customers that came from Quantcast or those silver customers that came from our Facebook campaign, right? And you want to be able to slice and dice uh, that data. Uh, looking at things on a cohort basis is very important. So what we can see uh, here is that by customer count in a given month, you start off with 100%, and that number can never go up. But over time, some customers leave. Again, we have so many startups, quite a few of them you know, are no longer in business three months later, six months later, uh, what have you. Uh, and so that number will drift down over time. And understanding what that curve looked like uh, is important, and it's hard to come up with a benchmark because uh, depending on your facts and circumstances, it can be a, a fairly wide range. What's really interesting, though, is to look at dollar churn. And so typically, when you have customers churn out, you're thinking also that dollars are churning out of the business. Uh, what is not unique to SendGrid, but is uh, uh, unusual and, and rare, is that our dollar churn is negative, which means that the dollars go up over time from our initial customer base. So let's just pick you know, January of 2011. You know, let's say we signed up 100 customers, and cumulatively, they were paying us $100 across all 100 customers. Well, over time, that 100 customers, well, that drifts down, right? Maybe there's only 70 today that are still on the SendGrid system. But that $100 didn't fall to $70. You know, it went up. It went to up to $130 or $180 because those customers themselves are growing. And so I sometimes get confused about what's positive or negative churn. So the way I'll define it here today is positive churn is like when it goes down. That's the normal way. And negative churn is when it goes up, which is when it does what you wouldn't expect, is to have revenue go up while your customer count is falling. And again, that's because the portfolio of our customers are these high growth companies. And while a lot of them you know, flake out to zero, a few of them grow up and become Foursquare or Pinterest and Spotify and customers like that. Uh, one other uh, question on sort of that negative churn is, again, as a general manager, you oftentimes have to think about what projects do I fund? You're a finance professional and you're doing your budget. Hopefully you're planning your 2013. We kicked that off actually today, our 2013 budgeting process uh, for the fall. And think about what are we going to fund next year? And I think, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's a good idea to fund any project designed to reduce churn. Right? It's just so compelling to keep existing customers. And you think, I just think about it as filling a leaky bucket. Right? You can spend money on sales and marketing all day long to keep putting more water in the bucket, but if you're not plugging the holes, you know, you're fighting a losing battle. And that's why whenever someone says, hey, we need to do this or that because it helps reduce churn, that is almost always a winning argument. So let's talk about profitability. So we talked about growth and profitability. Uh, and I'll talk bottom up. So you know, counting revenue by employee, cost per employee, we have financial systems for that. Uh, the financial statements, income statement, uh, statement of cash flows uh, are great. I'm going to focus on uh, some of our customer metrics um, as it relates to uh, Zora. Specifically, the CAC and uh, lifetime value of a customer. So, customer acquisition costs. This means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so, the reason I'm smiling is I'm thinking of our, our CFO. So, when he thinks about customer acquisition costs, he gets a big bucket of costs and divides by a small amount of deals to come up with a high number. Because I'm the CEO and a former salesperson, I tend to think of a very small number of costs. I have a narrow view of costs, and I think of a broad view of the number of deals, and I come up with a very low number. Um, but we'll talk about some commonalities, but definitely understanding those, those layers of cost and how they uh, interrelate. Uh, and then the key is, uh, what is the payback? You know, what is your sort of your average MRR per customer, and what does that look like uh, in terms of payback? So we'll do a little, do a little bit of math. Uh, so if you, in your organization your monthly sales costs are $100,000 and your monthly marketing costs are 150 dollars and you close 600 deals, uh, then what I'll call middle of the road math, you know, your, your customer acquisition cost is just summing them and dividing, which is 416 in this example. Uh, and that's the way our CFO, Chad, likes to think about it. Um, we have a self-serve model. 94% of our transactions, people just come to our website, give us a credit card, use our APIs, and we never talk to them. So I say our cost is zero uh, on the margin, but somewhere between you know, Chad's numbers and my numbers gives, gives some kind of an estimate. There's actually a, a, another related metric that our marketing people use called CPA. I think it's cost per account. And they just look at the variable marketing cost to acquire a particular account. So again, in any particular month, we might run 15 different marketing programs. 
Uh, so you're running an AdWords program, right? And so you'll say, I'm gonna spend $25,000 this month on an AdWords program, and it generates you know, 25 accounts. That was $1,000 per account in what they call CPA, which is a, a more narrow definition than the broader uh, CAC. Uh, and I've also seen uh, another company take an even more, a, a more broader view than our CFO. They included not only sales and marketing costs, but also support costs, uh, which at SendGrid are very material. Uh, one of our big differentiators is you can call us 24-7, chat or email, and we will, we will help you solve your email deliverability problem. And you don't need to be a SendGrid customer. So your company, your friend's company, if your email is not getting inbox, call us, we'll help you. We've got a bunch of smart people that can help solve it. The thing about email systems, they tend to go down at the worst possible time, you know, right before the big announcement or something you have going on, and that's what we uh, do to help people get out of jams, and they realize that they shouldn't be doing that, and they'll just let us take care of it going forward. So that's CEC. So let's talk about the, uh, the payback. So if the uh, average MRR is $100, and your costs are 416 to acquire, then it's you know, 4.16 months to pay back, which is fantastic. Uh, we did our latest round of funding, a Series B, led by Bessemer. Um, and Bessemer's rule is if your uh, math solves to 12 months or less, you know, call them. They want to invest in you. Uh, and, you know, SendGrids is, you know, far below the 12, when they were very happy to, to lead our B round, uh, which is great. I've also seen one twist on this, where rather than using the, the whole MRR, is using your uh, gross margin. So again, if you have a 20% cost of sales, in our business it's hosting costs and support costs or our cost of goods sales, we might net that out as another way to look at it. Uh, but I think the key is to really compare the cost to the lifetime value. And the big lesson there is you don't want to be doing sharp math, like you know, thinking about the gross margin percentage. You want to drive a truck between these two numbers. And the real shortcut is you want to, uh, if you can keep your cost in the hundreds and your value in the thousands, you know, that's an awesome business. Uh, and whether, you know, how you do the math on lifetime value of a customer. So one of the key variables is, you know, you get that $100 a month, how long does it go on? Well, we're a three-year-old business. It's hard to know what our churn rate looks like five years out. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, so Chad, again, being very conservative, he's like, wow, we just don't count anything past three years. We truncate everybody at three years for a lifetime value calculation. And I'm thinking, hmm, you know, there's real cash flows out there, discounted present value. There's, there's a lot more value. And so, again, reasonable people can disagree about how you might do some of that math, but you just want to get a sense for the lifetime value if it's, you know, a 36-month average duration or something longer. Uh, you know, uh, if you have a, a an older business, you might have a, a real data to work with. Uh, and then just net out the cost of revenue, net out the cost of uh, uh, acquisition, and you get that lifetime value of a customer. Again, if you want to be fancier, you could use uh, net present value uh, concepts here as well. But again, I think if you have to think that closely about it, you know, red flags are everywhere. That's not a good business. You know, if it costs you $40,000 to generate a $45,000 lifetime value, woo, that's not good. That's, that's danger zone. Uh, you want to be in the, you know, it costs you $400 to get $2,000. So you have lots of, lots of room for error. Uh, with that, just a uh, few resources I wanted to put in the deck. I'm happy to share that. Uh, I'm easy to reach. Uh, I think that what's great about all of this is it really helps you understand where to focus in a business. You know, any business has so many different things they can focus on, lots of different opportunities uh, to focus on. And I think the whole value of reporting and analytics is to, uh, I call it the, uh, you're in the business of aha moments. You want to be like, aha, this is a problem. Why is this sector, you know, have a churn rate that's so much higher than that one? But it doesn't tell you what to do. You know, that's why you need, you know, great teams and smart managers and people to get underneath those numbers and figure out, oh, well, you know, this has low churn and this has high churn. How do we you know, make this look like that? And uh, hopefully they're straightforward things, and, uh, but they aren't, aren't always, which makes business and life very interesting. Uh, again, I'm Jim Franklin, CEO at SendGrid. Uh, I think we'll be taking questions uh, after our second presenter. Thank you. So I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir here today because everyone seems to be really on board with the subscription model here, which is really nice. I feel like I'm in a room of like-minded individuals. It's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, Emma is a, a subscription-based email and communications platform specializing in creative, design-focused, and brand-centric small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, we were founded in, in 2003 in Nashville, Tennessee, and 
Uh, we service and cater to nonprofits and agencies and small and mid-sized businesses all across the country and uh, even a couple of international clients as well. Uh, one of our key differentiators is also our award-winning customer service support team. We won a Stevie this year. We're really, really proud of that. So uh, we're, we're happy to, just like Jim had said earlier, we're happy to talk to anybody about anything. And uh, if you just want to call and talk about your cats, that's totally fine. We're, we're pretty into that. <coughs> uh, so in the subscription economy, one of the key metrics to measure is the customer lifetime value. Jim had alluded to this earlier. This is sort of, to me, the end-all, be-all of the metrics in terms of what, what you want to measure to get the effectiveness of your business. Uh, it incorporates the entire life cycle of a customer, modeling out the financial impact on your business. Uh, knowing your customer lifetime value allows you to maximize your growth and profit potential. Uh, it incorporates things like revenue, the cost of acquisition, and your churned out revenue. Um, <clears throat> the basic formula is you take that total value of your recurring revenue, and then you reduce the cost to acquire the customer, and then you take out your churned revenue from that time frame, and then you, you drop out your cost of goods sold, and you get uh, you take out your hardware and your support costs, and then basically you end up with a final number that that value of that customer is. Uh, using that number, you can you can generate a lot of uh, of different operational metrics for your company. You can you can figure out exactly where you want to go and drive your business, and figure out who is doing the right thing on your customer base, and where you can go after and chase more of those businesses. Uh, that being said, let's uh, look at some of the specifics of the customer lifetime value metric and break it down into some of its individual parts. Uh, revenue growth being the, the number one sort of piece we look into. Where's that top line growth? You know, let's really figure out where, where the top line's coming from. Uh, you gotta factor in things like net recurring revenue, which is your inbound revenue. Uh, not just number of accounts, but actual revenue that they're driving. Um, you take that and then you take out the churned revenue from the accounts from that time period. So you basically have net positive or uh, subtracting out the churned revenue to get a, a final number for that time period. Um, the other opportunity you have in the revenue side of things is your upsell. Once you've got a big group of customers and accounts, you can really start selling them other additional products and features to drive out either one time or recurring ARPU, which is sort of the most unfortunate acronym thing in the business. I wish we could come up with something better than ARPU, but uh, it's, it, it is what it is. We've got to just say it. Um, <clears throat> one of the good things about partnering with a company like Zawara for Emma is the ability to quickly expose this kind of net recurring information uh, in, in our business. We're able to quickly drive into all of our individual customer behaviors and see those, those uptick revenues from a recurring standpoint as well as the the, uh, the churn revenue that happens on a monthly basis. Um, we're able to expose that information pretty quickly in our Salesforce dashboards and um, really expose all that, all that information to our operational teams so that they can be driving forward the company and making sure that those revenues are, are, are increasing going up and to the right. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of a, a dashboard that we use. We have a couple of satellite cities in where we have some uh, sales sales operations, and one of them is in Texas. This is our Texas dashboard. Um, we have a presence in Austin and San Antonio, and we like to track it against some unmanned cities in Texas, which are in Houston and in Dallas. So we look at the number of accounts and the number of deals that we do, as well as the overall revenue growth that we see over a month over month basis, and we can kind of see the trending of the revenues over the course of time in, in those cities for a quick, quick look comparison. It's sort of a high level view of, of how those cities are doing and how our sales operations are doing in, in manned and unmanned cities. Um, so this is where our Salesforce Connector really helps us accomplish this and make sure that we are tracking our business in the right way and thinking about it from an operational standpoint. Uh, so the next piece is the cost of acquisition. This is sort of a hairy beast. It can You can look at it from an overall perspective, but it really, it, it's not really, clear what that means to your business until you really get down to some of the specifics of the individual customers. Um, you take the sales and marketing costs overall and you simply divide it over the number of deals closed to get a, a pretty standard number. Um, that ideal number again is should be somewhere under 12 months. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, if you have it actually more than 12 months, the problem is you're really putting a heavy burden on your retention and if you if you start slipping up on your retention efforts, what you find is you're actually losing money on some of your customers. Um, 
important thing to remember here on these things is that the averages can be very deceiving. Um, it's an important overall gauge of your business. Just look at the cost of acquisition on your overall business. Um, but it shouldn't be applied directly to your operational marketing activities. You really need to break it down into these subsets of, uh, of customers and really drive into all the operational things that you can do to drive more profitable revenue. Um, <clears throat> for instance, so Emma has a couple of advertising spots that we've uh, that we found drive out higher revenue accounts, and uh, we're able to spend more money to advertise in those areas to drive out more business, even though it's less. It, it looks like it's more cost on average for the customer. Uh, we're actually making more money on the on the bottom line because we're we're finding higher sourced revenues for those customer bases. Um, it, it brings back that old adage, the, the half of the money you're spending on advertising that you're not really sure is working, but you don't know which half to cut. Um, we were able to look at our Google AdWords spend and, and really hone in on some of the sources of revenues and figure out that um, certain keywords were performing better than others, and we were able to cut our, cut our marketing spend in that, in, that, in that AdWords budget in half, and we're still able to drive the same amount of revenue in a, in a monthly basis. So um, it's really important to really drive home all the specific cohorts of these customers that you're coming into. Uh, the last metric we're going to talk about today is churn. Uh, churn is the largest revenue multiplier in the subscription business. You're, you really got to make sure that you're maintaining your customers over the course of time because typically you're spending more money to, to acquire them on the front end than you're actually driving out of revenue on an ongoing basis. So you need to make sure that you're keeping them around so that you can drive up more revenue you got a lot of revenue upside by maintaining churn. It goes straight down to the bottom line. Um, <clears throat> lowering your churn rates means that you have a higher allowable acquisition cost, so you can go after them uh, with a more aggressive pitch, or you can pitch them with different pricing, or you can spend more on the marketing costs to go out and acquire more customers. Because you know you're keeping them for a longer time period, you're able to actually drive out more profit at the bottom line. Um, when you're accounting for churn, you have to make sure that you're, you're looking at it both on a unit basis in terms of number of accounts and also from a net revenue perspective as you think there's a whole swath of customers that can be average or below average or above average. If you're, if you're churning out a bunch of the low revenue accounts, it may not necessarily have a huge impact on your revenue, uh, but it still looks bad from a unit basis or, it, or you might be masking things by having, you're retaining all of your lower base clients and you're losing some of your higher uh, big whales, as, as it were. Um, so one of the key, key things to do to, is to break it down into different cohorts as well here and uh, really start looking at it by the different products that you serve, uh, the size of the customer, and even by the age of the customer. So you might not have three years worth of data uh, where you can actually say, we know what happens to the customer after a certain period of time, but you can you can, you can project forward based on some monthly averages. It, typically what happens is these curves start to sort of flatten out and you can really project for the, for the whole term of the, of the customer lifetime expectancy. Uh, and you get a really good sense of what kind of revenues you're driving out for the business. Uh, so this is a little example of some churn reporting that, that Emma does on a, on a regular basis. We looked at monthly churn on a on a month over month basis in terms of uh, a particular cohort of uh, of, of customers, <clears throat> we we're comparing here in this one 2010 versus 2011, seeing the differences between some of the programs that we were doing on a on an ongoing basis, and uh, we saw in 2011 that there was a significant increase in churn from a unit basis. But when we looked at the term to average revenue on the outgoing perspective from a net revenue perspective, it was actually not that much difference. So. While we were losing more customers than we were in 2010, we were actually not losing as much revenue. So uh, when you really start breaking it down into these component parts, you get some really interesting information about your business. And you might not have to raise red flags in certain instances. And you can really drill down into the customers that you want to keep versus the customers that you feel obligated to keep because you're trying to keep a number artificially too high. Uh, and so that's pretty much the, the big thing that we're really, we're really doing in terms of measuring our subscription metrics. We put everything together into one giant ball of customer lifetime value and try and make sure that we're operating against that number and that we're hitting our targets and growing the business from not only a top line revenue perspective, but from a bottom line perspective. Um, we're you know, keenly focused on driving all this stuff on a, on a real time basis and having Zora as a partner really helps us achieve that goal by exposing all of this revenue information, this great 
uh, upsell opportunities and incorporating new business models and pricing and uh, and having all that stuff at the ready and, and being able to, to go out and sell any product that we really want to integrate with and, and, and layer on additional revenues. So it's, uh, it's been a wild ride and we really appreciate it. Thanks. We've got a couple mics out in the audience, so uh, now's a great time. You know, we've learned a lot about making data-driven decisions, so incredible insight from, from both SendGrid as well as Miami. So let's go and open up for any questions. It's, it's something where, you, I mean, you kind of have to apply a little bit more art than science, perhaps, to it. But um, seeing some of the trends, for instance, when we, we did a program where we offered two months free for new customers, and what we found was that uh, our retention rates, or we had a, a huge sales bump, right? So we had these, this big bubble of new accounts that came on board. And then after we started actually billing them on the, on the regular billing cycle, we saw a significant increase in churn. And so we had to sort of account for that in the overall churn rate. Uh, we didn't really know how many of them would churn out over the course of time. We knew it was going to be something more than what we normally had, had seen because we were exposing a new customer base. Um, and so we had to sort of apply what we knew as existing churn rates and then put a sense check on top of it to say, well, if we increase our sales by 50%, we're probably going to see, uh, you know, our hope is that we're going to see some kind of a 25 to 30% churn or less. Uh, above and beyond what our normal churn would be for that same time period and sort of just evaluated against that. And then as the months progressed, we got to see more and more data and we got to calibrate that a little bit better to sort of understand how it would go. So it's all about just putting a, a, a number on the wall and trying to throw a dart at it and, you know, making sure that you're, you're setting goals and you're, you're measuring performance and you're checking back on it and, and you're seeing what works and what doesn't. I don't know what cohort analysis was back when I was an accountant, you know, doing receivables and whatnot, but I was like, oh, that's cohort analysis, right? It's just like, uh, you, know, you think about receivables, right? What was collected from a particular monthly billing period? So I think we started very early with cohort analysis, uh, but then what happens is, you know, you, you keep digging and adding more layers, right? So that uh, just having some very uh, simple, we had a, a similar fact that you're talking about, we had a, an 8x move in web traffic. We had a big PR announcement, so like, oh, well, how's that gonna affect our whole lead funnel and the marketing conversions? What turns out is maybe we had a, a 2x you know, change in revenue with an 8x change in this. And you see the, how that uh, changed over time. But then we want to look at all those uh, cohorts as customers would come in on a, on a free plan and how do they migrate up to paid plans over time. And we just started doing that in the last six months. So the business was maybe 30 months old when we started doing that. And it just it becomes an a, a ongoing process as one answer begets you know, more questions and so on. I'll say this too. It's, um it's pretty data intensive to get into some of these cohort analyses without a program in place. Doing this stuff in Excel can be uh, challenging, time consuming, and you might find your, your finance guy is actually tearing his hair out because of it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so uh, it's really important that when you start doing cohort analysis that you, uh, you take a healthy respect for it and that you have some kind of a, a plan for a program because as Jim said before, you're really going to start digging into further and further cohorts, and it's 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 almost like it, it begets more questions, and you're you're really only going to understand your customers better by digging further and further into into the cohorting. Yeah. We um, on the technology side, we used Excel to start, and then literally the you know Excel and the, even the PC with lots of RAM, and it would just sort of start to you know slow down and freeze. So then we switched to Access, and we're just launching a good data project, so really kind of going Zura good data to automate all the Excel Access. Uh, processes we put in place. It was the, the five rows, right? As far as you know, new customers, you know, the the more business from those customers, the less business from existing customers, the lost customers, and then we look at that by all the uh, different segments, right? whether it's by uh, you know customer count, by dollars, by uh, geography. Uh, so whether you know, what's happening in the UK versus the US, or uh, by marketing channel, you know, people who come in from Quantcast, uh, by product type, so the free accounts, the light accounts, the materially paid accounts. So those are all the dimensions when we think about, uh, you know, revenue. Uh, we have to get those, uh, there's a, so there's a lot of uh, dimensions that we, we think about it. On the cost side, I think, you know, again, you, I think about it uh, uh, from a marginal cost uh, perspective, which can be sort of zero on the, on the CAC side, uh, 
uh, to where some people use the full boat. They do sales, marketing, and support costs you know, in the numerator divided by number of transactions in a month. Uh, where Chad, and I think the standard formula our CFO uses is sales and marketing costs. You know, VPs all in, the whole travel, all that stuff, divided by number of deals, you know, comes up with that CAC. But I think the, the managerial rule is just make sure that that CAC and the total lifetime value are very far apart. And I think lifetime value in early stage SaaS companies is hard, but you don't know how long that future cash flow is. And again, just reasonable people disagree. And just whatever you, that range is of numbers, make sure the lifetime value is, you know, a lot bigger. You know, 3x, 4x, that, that CAC. So again, you can calc calculate the CAC. I think I will measure from you know, zero to 700, let's say. But the lifetime value is somewhere between 1,800 and 4,000. Right? Just look at those two ranges, make sure there's no chance of overlap. In Jim's presentation, he did note differentiating churn by customer downgrading versus someone canceling. And so a lot of metrics do actually combine churn all into one number. And so being able to see that level of differentiation is, is critical as well. You know, I think that comes back into the sort of gross margin picture for um, for the the sort of you know tech companies out there. Uh, you have to expend some level of R and D just to sort of maintain pace or to to keep your customers happy. Um, it's 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 all a matter of exactly how you're qualifying your your cost of goods sold at, at some point. Um, and in some people, we don't necessarily do it this way, but uh, some people do include. Uh, a, a team of R&D people that are actually working on maintenance of, of the product as part of their cost of goods sold. So uh, that actually is incorporated into some people's analysis. It just depends on, you know, the devil's in the details of what that number fully entails. Yeah, I think uh, the theory of that is correct. You probably should allocate some R&D. I'm probably thinking maybe 10% of our R&D uh, sort of FTEs are probably related to just you know, supporting that core product or the support function uh, we actually, in our Agile process, we categorize user stories with N and S. N is new stuff, and S is not new stuff. Uh, you know, that's, that S is just you know, the things you've got to build to kind of keep the system working. And that does seem like it should be you know, netted out in that lifetime value. All spreadsheets so far. Yeah, so we're, we're, I think we're both sort of in the same boat here. We're, uh, we're both heavy on spreadsheets at this point. It's uh, incorporating a lot of disparate information together into one particular place, and it, in some senses it's kind of dangerous to have all that information in the same place. But um, I think we're both looking for something that's a little more automated and, and can incorporate all those things to get that holistic picture and to get it now or yesterday instead of waiting until the end of the month and somebody has to churn all this data out and then do all this analysis and then you have a dead piece of paper that doesn't mean anything anymore. So um, I, think, I think we're both sort of looking in that, that automated tool process to make sure that we're exposing that information on a regular basis. Uh, so that's a very timely topic. Uh, we just did our first annual plan last month. Uh, so our initial target market was uh, more or less by default with all the uh, startups and then we're moving to, towards the enterprise and customers want you know, uh, assurance of prices and SLAs and security and a whole different set of uh, features. And we sort of settled on the one year. Uh, as we think there's just so much uncertainty that we're just sort of comfortable doing you know, one year but not, not like a three year that some customers might want to you know, lock in pricing. Uh, so we'd rather just sort of do it for a year and we'll revisit it uh, from there. And today you offer a, a discount if someone signs up for a year versus a month, or what, what does your pricing discounts look like? Uh, it's a little hard to compare since it's really it's a different uh, uh, really product, right, regarding the, the service level and security and the, the dedicated account management and custom billing and all that. So uh, okay. but in the theory, yes, you would get a, you'd get a break on, the, on, the, on an apples-to-apples -apples basis for the, for the annual commitment, Sounds but paid good. monthly. So we, uh, so we offer a, a sort of pay for the year up front model where it's an annual subscription and we do offer a 10% discount for our customers that, that decide to go that route. We find that it's interesting that there's, a, there's actually a, a positive churn effect for people who do sign up for the year. Uh, they typically re-sign at a higher rate than, uh, than we would over the course of a month to month period for that same sort of cohort of, of, of accounts. So uh, things like that are really good to evaluate and make sure that 
um, you're reaching out to your customer and, and maintaining that relationship, and you're not just taking the dollars and running for the next 12 months. Right. Interesting finance implications, right, about how you handle that cash flow about incenting people to pay up front. Coming from a perpetual software world, you know, for 18 years, it's, that, was a, that was our financing, right, just getting that high margin money up front. And so you have to take that hit for the dilution on the financing in this kind of business. But then on the other hand, you know, the valuations are very, very high when you have that you know, really high quality uh, you know, prepaid monthly revenue is, is awesome. Uh, clearly, uh, we have a you know, large base of free accounts, which has a much higher churn. As you go to sort of these uh, light or bronze accounts, which are maybe $10 a month, which we still kind of view those as like lead flow. And then for $80 a month is sort of what we call materially paid. And that's the, where you get your own IP address. And so, and then it you know, goes up, uh, up from there. And so certainly the sort of higher up the stack you go, the, the lower the churn rates. So we're at the very top of the stacks, so there are top 250 customers that have dedicated account managers and that type of thing. And the churn is essentially zero. Uh, because we pay a lot of attention to that. I mean, it, hits a, it would be on the board packet if one of those uh, people left. Uh, so they get that much attention. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, uh, a real difference depending on where you look at uh, the level of commitment. I think one you know, key, I think, to making subscription businesses work is being easy on, easy off. You know, I think of Netflix as a good example in this point, right? It's easy to sign up, it's easy to suspend your account, it's easy to reactivate it. And so we have to do the same thing with SendGrid, is like having these month-to-month -month contracts and if you, know, you run out of money for a while, you want to suspend your business, you can hit suspend. But you keep all of your, like your IP address and that kind of stuff, we'll keep it around for you. So you want to come back 60 days later, 90 days later, you can reactivate it and not have to kind of start from scratch again uh, with everything. That being said, we can be a little sneaky, right? So it's, you know, it's easy to onboard, but then once you're onboard and you start using the APIs and start baking our stuff into your system, you start using our reports to run your management meetings and things, you know, then it's just, it's, uh, it's not contractually or legally hard to leave, it's just operationally you know, unpleasant. It's just like, oh, we're used to how SendGrid does things. And you know, that's how you kind of just get, and once it's in the infrastructure, it just works and people move on to other priorities. We're taking care of the mail, like other people take care of the payroll or the billing, and you're just part of the infrastructure of how business works. We're self-serve. Uh, we don't have a sales team, uh, which is awesome, right? So our sales team is our customers. Our net promoter score hit 50 last month. So if you're familiar with the net promoter score methodology, right, it's really, it's our customers tell other developers, hey, don't mess with mail, just let Sangrid do it. Uh, that being said, we do have like four people that will answer the phone if you call and say, tell me about your pricing plan. Uh, so that's just a, something we're doing right now is to, uh, looking at, you know, spooling up a sales team to actually call people and say, you know, hey, use our stuff. And whether it's annual or monthly, those are the issues we're, uh, you know, we're looking, at, we're looking uh, forward you know, uh, to dealing with those in the coming year. I can, Perhaps, I can yeah. also say that um, because we, we have a sales team and we do some of the sales for uh, the annual plans where it's a more customized approach, uh, we find that there are certain customers who prefer to pay up front for the year who have that sort of annual budgeting process and they want to expend the money at the, at the onset of their, of their fiscal year, for instance. Like universities are, are a, key, a key user of that kind of philosophy. So we find that it's not a detractor at all. It's actually uh, a benefit to the customer and it also allows us to get that revenue up front and it's just a really, it's a good boon for, for cash flow and you lock in the customer for a guaranteed 12 months at the, at the very least. So uh, we find that it's actually not pulling teeth necessarily. It's more of a, a collaborative sale, meeting the customer where they want to be in terms of the billing system with the help of Zora, of course. We're incentivizing it with a great service, right? We don't, uh, great book is uh, Punished by Rewards, if you've ever read that one. Uh, you'd be very careful about you know, the do this, get that mentality and that sort of dynamic. And so really trying to you know, just wow people with a, with a great uh, service is how that, it's incentive for one developer to tell another developer you know, something cool and awesome that they found. And so we encourage that with you know, alcohol and t-shirts uh, we have five people on a developer relations team that travel the world, going to hackathons and startup events, and we you know, have the same you know, banner up places so that they just, it's just really creating awareness that you don't have to spend your nights and weekends figuring out why some customer with an AOL address isn't getting your confirmation email. It will take care of that problem, and developers are happy to let us fool with that, and they can focus on the mobile, social, gamified, iPhone 5 app they want to work on next.
I was saying classic software, you know, renewals are separate from you know, hunting and farming and all that stuff. So if, you, uh, you know, if we pay maybe a 7% commission, uh, say 12% variable on new business, we might pay 5% variable on maintenance business with, with separate teams. Uh, we haven't had that at, issue yet here at SynGrid. Yeah, we don't have a, as formalized a process even as that. It, it's, it's more that our product does the renewal for us, and we, we presume that there's not a lot of hard selling to do the renewal. If we find that our sales team has spent a lot of time in renewing the business, then we'll, we'll reward them with, with a commission-based um, payout. But for the most part, our, our product tends to do the renewal for us. Yeah, I think our early thinking would certainly be you know, not. And just uh, on the month-to-month -month, uh, business, the, the few reps we do have, uh, you know, they're paid a percentage of the first month, uh, and it's not 100%. It's not half a percent. It's you know, or not 50 percent either. It's it's very modest uh, compared to an enterprise sales plan where it's substantial. Well, thank you very much. Huge. Really appreciate that. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.